This is Seeds Podcast, bringing you tips, conversations, and information about applied behavior analysis. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode four of season three Seed Podcast. So today we have um, CY, my co-host. Hi, Hi. CY. And we are also very fortunate to have um, Maggie here with us. Um, so Maggie is a senior lecturer in education at Bangor University. She is also the course director of the Master of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis program. Um, her research interest is in developing affordable, evidence-based, and sustainable application of ABA for use in, um, in school. Right. And also, Maggie is the president to the board of the UK Society for Behavior Anal Analysis. So welcome, Maggie. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's lovely to be talking with you. Hi. All right. So could you tell us a little bit about how you got into all of this? How did you like maybe <laughs> I don't know how far you sure. have to go, by, but, you know, how did you, you know, start your journey in ABA and subsequently ended up doing what you're doing now? Sure. Well, it was a really long time ago now. And while I live in Wales, I've lived in Wales for 20 years. I am originally from the USA. So I started my ABA career in the mid 1990s around the Boston area in America. And that was just about the time where parents especially in the Northeast of America, we're getting really interested in um, ABA programs and ABA home programs. So I had a job as a provider of delivering home programs for young autistic children in their homes. And then I got a job I loved even more, which was working for a school district where the children were in ABA classes in the day. And I went to their houses in the evening and worked with the parents at what they were doing. And then you know, as it happens, I met a boy and that boy wanted to move to Wales. And so I came with him um, and it worked out really well because there was a PhD in applied behavior analysis at Bangor at the time. So I was able to come and work with um, Professor Bud Mace and work on my PhD in ABA. So we thought we would do that for a couple of years and go back to America. But here I still am in North Wales 20 years later. And when I arrived in Wales, the situation of ABA was really different than it was that I'd left behind in America. So in America, it was really quite mainstream at the time. Um, the government in Massachusetts was funding programs for children zero to three, kids older than three were having ABA in their schools. And when I moved to Wales, it was, it was very rare. So there's the occasional home program that was provided for by the parents, often with some conflict um, with the local authority. And there wasn't many behavior analysts around. So a lot of um, programs were being imported in from America and a, just a different culture of it was being built up. And where I live, where CNI, CNI, uh, CY and I both live in North Wales, it's a pretty rural area and parents generally weren't clamoring for ABA services. Um, so they weren't hiring consultants, they weren't going to tribunals with their local authorities. And so there just wasn't a big demand. And so one of the natural ways to work was actually to find the children in the schools. So to find maybe an autism unit in a school, um, work with the special needs schools, find schools that were struggling with challenging behavior and help there because that's where the demand was. So when, we first, when I first started working privately in the UK or clinically about 15 years ago now, schools were the only place where I could work um, because that's, the people who wanted to hire behavior analysts. Okay. Was that, um, you know, I understand that you did spend some time in the school when back in the U.S. So was the system very different back in the U.S. and, you know, moving to Wales and was the system very different and, and how was the transition for you? Sure. So at the time, I mean, and to put in context, you know, America's a really big place, isn't it? And I was working in Boston and at the time, um, there were two big ABA schools nearby. There's the New England Center for Children and the May Institute. So there was a lot of demand for ABA services and the schools were providing it. Nobody had to fight for it. Nobody had to ask for it. Um, it was part of a natural provision for young children at the time. So I turned up, I did my job, people were happy and I went home and, and I didn't think very hard. Um, I didn't have to convince anybody that what I was mm -hmm. doing was helpful and useful. And we moved to the UK, it just wasn't known. Right? So nobody knew what ABA was, so we had to convince 
um, head teachers and teachers and parents that this could be really useful for their child. Okay, okay. Um, so were there major differences um, in terms of practicing in more of a one-on-one -on -one at home um, and then, you know, like you said, with the New England Center, there's more of a center, private practice. And then I'm just curious, what was the application like, you know, in a group setting and yeah. you have so many teachers and you have so many students, um, how do you apply the science in that setting? I think one of the things that built up in the UK, and we're still, we're still struggling with this legacy now, I'll be honest, was that in sort of the mid nineties when the parents you know, got on the internet and they read the papers and they thought, this is what I want for my child. There just were a lot of providers. And so the home program model built up in the UK. I don't know what the situation is in Malaysia, uh, but the home program model is still very evident um, in the UK. And this is where the parents privately pay for the behavior analyst and they hire tutors to come to their house mm -hmm. and the behavior analyst visits about once a month. Yep. And I believe that this model, which wasn't what the model in the States was at all at the time where I was working, um, built up out of necessity. There were very few BCBAs and to make the programs affordable, the BCBAs only came to visit about once a month, once every six weeks. And that model continues um, today in the UK and it has, it works really well sometimes and other times I think it doesn't work as well. But the situation, as I said, in America, but we were also working in homes with the under threes. Um, and this is long before there were BCBAs. So it's hard to compare, of course, um, my experience from 20 years ago, which is sort of a pre-BCBA time. Okay, okay, okay. So then um, applying what, what yeah. you've learned um, and what you do in the US and now in the UK, in the school, tell us what ABA looks like in the classroom. Um, okay, so in my program, <laughs> I think what's important is that, so just to back up a little bit, what I'm really interested in is developing a kind of an ABA model that can be affordable and sustainable in schools um, for a long time. Because often what we have in the UK is we have these, we have children on home programs, they've made lots of gains on their home programs. Um, and when they want to move those into the school, it's often a very awkward time. Mm -hmm. So um, a home program is very intensive. Um, it's all one-to-one -one with a the child. There might only be a few adults interacting with the child. Um, and those programs are run by BCBAs. And then we transition to school and it's really different, right? So in school, the programs are run, you know, teachers run the classrooms and there's often a lot of staff working with a child. And there often aren't the resources for that sort of one-to-one -one intensity, right? And in fact, school isn't designed for that. So right. when classroom teachers observe the one-to-one -one going on all day, they're not very comfortable with that delivery model. Um, and that can create a bit of tension. So what I am interested in is working with teachers to develop ABA systems that work in their classrooms for them. So programs that can be sustainable for the long term. So they look really different. Um, and so I'm just going to digress here um, and start sort of at the beginning of where I think it, for me, it's really interesting. And that question really is, what is ABA? So you said this podcast is about what is ABA? Well, ABA is just applying the science of behavior. And the science of behavior is so simple and elegant, right? So it's, you have a person and that person sort of finds themselves in a state, right? They're in an antecedent, behavior hasn't happened yet as the antecedents, maybe they're a little bit hungry, maybe they're a little bit lonely, maybe they're a little bit tired. And depending on where they find themselves, there's behaviors they can do to make themselves less hungry or more social or, or rest, right? And then, so you're, you're in a state where you kind of want something, you engage in a behavior to get that something that you want. Okay, and people are going to engage in the behaviors that are the easiest and most effective for them. So applied behavior analysis is just, it's just understanding that and then altering the environment to make the behaviors we want to see more of um, easier to do, right? So that's really all ABA is. And then there are just almost an infinite number of ways to apply that, okay? And a lot of times, in, I think in behavior analysis, 
we like everybody else fall into habits, right? So we have habits of how we deliver ABA. So when a lot of people think, what is ABA? They think about a really particular kind of intervention for young kids with autism, okay? And we can trace that back to, um, to Ivar Lobos and the, the UCLA model that happened in the 1970s. And that was teaching a developmental curriculum, breaking skills down into their smallest components and reinforcing that learning, okay? And the model of that was very much a high dose of teaching, right? So we put it in a medical model, that's 40 hours a week of one-to-one -one teaching. And the literature has maybe pushed that back a bit now to maybe 20. So we look between 20 to 40 hours a week of one-to-one -one teaching. And within that, we've only ever really experimentally played around with dose, right? Mm -hmm. So is less of that effective? Well, actually not really. Um, 20 to 40 hours of that model is about what you want. But that's just one way to do ABA, right? And so there's more ways to do it. Um, it doesn't have to be that intensive in focus. So in my programs in special needs schools, we are working on a model where the students only get an hour a day of one-to-one -one teaching, okay? So a behavior analyst is gonna write those teaching goals from a developmental curriculum, right? So every child's individually assessed the way they are on all ABA programs. And what we're asking is what skills do they already have and what skills do they still need to be able to learn from the natural environment, okay? So lots of times um, autistic children just aren't as tuned in to the natural environment um, and they might miss some important skills such as imitation, following instructions, uh, communication. Um, some of the softer um, social skills, sometimes, not always. And so we do an assessment and we think, okay, so these are the skills that children um, will benefit from learning. And we work with the teacher and the classroom assistant to make sure that they can all teach those skills. Okay, so that they can do the discrete trials, um, either through play or at the table to teach those skills. And it's only an hour a day, right? Which is hardly anything. The literature would tell us five hours a day is not enough or five hours a week is not enough. And then what happens is it's a pretty, the classroom has a teacher and also about three, four classroom assistants working in it. Okay, so there might be about 12 young children with autism and learning disabilities in the classroom. And there'll be between about five to seven staff in that classroom throughout the day. They're gonna go on breaks. There's not five all the time. And so every one of those staff knows how to run the trials for each child, okay? And what we find when we do that is that for the rest of the day, while they're in group activities, the staff are practicing those skills. So if they were working on imitation in the one-to-one -one sessions, now we're at the water table, we're working on imitation. Now we're queuing up for lunch and we're working on imitation and we're out in the yard and we're working on imitation. And so that, while there's only an hour a day of one-to-one -one teaching, that generalization is happening all day long. And the other things that are happening is a lot of group activity, teacher-led group activity. So the classrooms are teacher-led. The behavior analysts at this point are also working on a function-based behavior plan for every child, okay? And what that means is they're saying, what are, what sort of behaviors is this child displaying that might not be a big deal when they're four and five, but could potentially limit their ability to, to fully access the community, okay? So sometimes you have a child who walks past uh, a, a lift or an elevator and they, oh, <laughs> desperate to go in the lift or the elevator, so they drop to the ground um, and it's a big to-do. But what happens over time perhaps is that while this doesn't seem like a big idea when they're four, someone can pick them up, right. when they're seven or eight, their parent stops taking them places that has lifts and elevators because this is a really big scene and they just can't cope. So we're gonna work on those behaviors really clearly when they're still quite young. So three, four, five years old. Um, can they cope with transitions? Do they know how to ask for what they want? We're gonna make sure that every child has a robust and intact communication system, okay? Either PECS or sign language or spoken language, whichever is appropriate for them. And essentially, by the time they're seven, they should all, what I hope for them is that they, they sort of, they can identify what they want. Like, oh, I have this sort of 
feeling. Um, this is what I want. They can ask for it. And then if necessary, they can wait for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the long-term goal of the programs. So we've run, because I've got so many amazing PhD students um, working with me. So we've really evaluated this model and find that the kids in this model make many, many more gains than kids who have um, education as usual in an SEN school. Okay. So and the other thing we find about this model is it's really easy to fade out of. So one of the things we sometimes see with the intensive programs is how do you stop them, mm -hmm. right? How do you go from intensive one-to-one -one in the clinic or a classroom or the home and transition to the classroom? But that happens sort of almost naturally because we're already in a classroom situation because the one-to-one -one is a really limited part of the day. And an explicit goal of the one-to-one -one sessions is that they're explicitly faded into group teaching. So that might be direct instruction. Uh, it might be, you know, depending on the learner, what they're doing so that we intentionally fade out the one-to-one -one teaching. So by the time the kids are eight or nine, they're able to work in a group setting um, and they need less intensive resources. Yeah, so so that's sense. what it looks like in the, in the SEN classrooms. I know, I have so many questions. So <laughs> SEN classroom, and that means you have probably about 12 kids in the classroom mm -hmm. and they all have different needs. Yeah. Right. They're, are they at different levels in terms yeah, of- So they're what? all in an SEN classroom. So they all have a learning disability. Okay. Okay. Right. And often in the UK, it's probably a pretty serious learning disability mm -hmm. or a very um, significant presentation of autism because if the children um, are more moderate and have more skills, they often do a few years in mainstream inclusion first. So the children we're working with here are probably the most impacted by their disability. Okay. So there, it's, is there an age group or yes. no? So it, this work is done with kids between the ages of three and we try and make seven the upper limit. And this is considered foundation phase, key stage one in a UK school. So there's kind of a step change in British schools um, between age seven and eight. Okay, okay. So does that mean they start right away in this school? So there is no home base, one-on-one, -on -one, so everything starts at the school. Nobody even thought to ask for it, right? So it's just the natural provision of the classrooms. Right. They come into the school and we use um, behavior analysis to help them learn. Okay, okay. And so they have one hour of one-on-one -on -one intensive yep. um, you know, session with um, the teacher or with the aide. Right. Okay. And then that, that, uh, do they all do that at the same time or was no. it? No. So it, no. Okay. So it's a real scheduling. This is, this is the trick of it. It's like a puzzle. So another important thing about the model is that there is something specific for the children to be doing all day long. So mm -hmm. often in a special school, you get a lot of time where kids are just sort of doing nothing and transitions. Um, so every um, moment of the day is scheduled so that two children might be getting one-to-one -one, and then another two groups of three or four are working with a classroom assistant and that's where they're, maybe they're in the sensory room or they're on the yard or they're at the water table. Maybe they're choosing videos, you know, they're taking turns choosing what they wanna watch on YouTube, things like that. Um, but they're specifically in group activities. And then a couple of kids will leave the group activities, come do their one-to-one -one and right. rejoin the group. So what you're saying earlier is that that teacher or that teacher aide who's working with that group of three kids now mm -hmm. know what to do and what she should be targeting with them in that natural activity right. within the natural exactly. environment. Okay. okay. And I think it's super interesting because if you think about the one-to-one -one program, some of the, some learners in those programs one of the things they struggle with is generalization, mm -hmm. right? I can do this with my tutor in my teaching room, but can I do it outside? But because essentially the teaching is kind of loose on these programs, right? So we have the one-to-one -one session, but everybody's practicing it and prompting it and reinforcing those skills all day. The generalization is built into the program. Mm -hmm. And we don't program as behavior analysts for that natural teaching. Um, it happens spontaneously. And we've done this in about seven or eight schools and everywhere we do it, it happens spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so that's one of my questions. It's just trying to visualize what it looks like in the classroom, in the playground, in the cafeteria, in the hallway. Yeah. So it's it's just happening across, you know, their day yeah, in the school. One of the things we've collected data on, of course, for the university projects, right, is I had some students um, collecting data on learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we found in this classroom was that outside of one-to-one -one teaching, every minute, more than every minute, the staff asked the child to do something and then followed up on it. Or the child made a request and the staff acknowledged the request, okay? So that those, even though they're, they're not having the one-to-one, -one, they're getting those learning opportunities nearly every single minute of the day. Mm. Um, so they're encountering the contingencies and the reinforcement um, and the yeah. prompting to improve their skills. You know, it's it's probably in the environment too, right? That allow us to have that many opportunities. Because think about it, if we're in a home setting, um, in the room doing one-on-one, -on -one, there is not enough opportunity. Uh, we almost have to create it and it, it just looks so awkward and, and not natural. Whereas in the school, it's just everywhere. And um, how, so how did you get the team, um, the, the teachers, to know how to do that, right? It takes a couple of years, um, I think, for it to really be fully embedded in a classroom. And the first thing we start with often are the behavior plans, right? Mm -hmm. So these are, you know, we've got a situation with transition. So every time you walk through the corridor, some of the children fall to the ground here. So what are we gonna do about that, okay? And we do that while we're working on we use the ABLES, right? So we just do a, a really robust assessment of developmental skills and then start training up the staff in the one-to-one -one teaching, okay? So every member of staff is trained up in um, how to deliver discrete trial teaching. And for the very young learners, like I said, it's often on the floor through play. As they get older, the teachers like the children at the table as they start to transition them into the older classrooms. And so we start with the discrete trial teaching and the function-based behavior plans. And the other thing we really insist upon is that schedule, right? Mm -hmm. So there aren't large periods of time during the day where the students don't have a meaningful activity to be engaged with, right? Because, I mean, the reason the 40 hours works, right, is we have all those learning opportunities. And the school days only, in Britain, it's only six hours a day. So they come in at nine, they leave at three, we can't waste any of those moments um, so that it needs to be purposeful all day long. And also the challenging behaviors happen in those quiet moments, right? <laughs> Where there isn't anything purposeful going on is when we tend to see the most challenging behaviors. Um, so the teachers find usually quite quickly that it works for them. But what's incredibly important is that two classrooms running this model don't look alike. So there's still teacher led classrooms. So if we're gonna run a behavior plan, we sit down with the teacher and say, does this work for you? Does it make sense? And we'll try and convince them this is why we think it'll work. But if they don't like it, we don't run it, okay? And some teachers love the tabletop work and other teachers really don't want that sort of um, structure in an early years classroom. And so for them, we work with them on how are we gonna do all this teaching, maybe even on the yard um, in a more play-like situation. So I think what's, very important about it for it to be sustainable is that it fits into the teacher's vision of their own classroom. And there's, but like I started with, there's so many ways to do ABA, right? It, there's so many ways to do it that we don't have to say it must look like mm -hmm. this, right? It can look a million different ways and still be adjusting the antecedents and making sure we reinforce, differentially reinforce the behaviors we wanna see, right? So it's about that sort of flexibility, I think. Mm -hmm. So Maggie, do you have any um, plans on bringing this system into a mainstream school? Okay. So in the mainstream schools, the work we do is really quite different. So that's a bit of a segue. Um, and that tends to be about whole school systems of behavior analysis for the entire mainstream school population. Mm -hmm. And then also, of course, using function-based behavior plans for the students in mainstream school who need a little bit of extra support. So whereas the work in the SEN schools has been primarily about teaching developmental learning to learn skills to young autistic children, the focus in the mainstream schools is more about um, 
readiness for learning, sort of emotional regulation, um, problem solving, and working with the teachers to be more consistent. So it's, it's a different, um, different application of ABA entirely, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you're, if it's in the mainstream school, I'm assuming there is a bit more of an inclusion. So it's in, in the student being in a classroom with other. So children. are you, so are you asking about autistic children in mainstream classrooms or just ABA work in mainstream classes in general? Um, working, applying the signs in the mainstream okay. classroom, regardless of whether. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there we absolutely 100, and we have to have teacher buy-in in the SEN schools, but in that situation, we have a behavior analyst around all the time, right? Okay. Um, so that in the SEN schools, it's a collaborative approach between the behavior analyst and the teacher. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a budget for that in an SEN school. So mainstream schools are not hiring behavior analysts, right? There's no scope um, for that. But what we're working on in the UK is an application of um, school-wide positive behavior support or positive um, behavior support in schools. It goes by both names simultaneously. And that comes again from um, America and the brilliant work um, of Rob Horner and George Sugai and all that early work in school-wide PBS, okay? And again, though, I mean, if so, I don't know how things are in Malaysia, but if you watch the school-wide PBS videos, um, that are coming out of America, they do not sit well for British people, right? Because there's, you know, there's great big noisy teachers running around the school and high-fiving and dancing and it's, um, and that it's American. So it represents an American culture, which doesn't sit so well in the UK. So I think school-wide PBS hasn't really taken on in the UK because often UK teachers can't see themselves in that model. So mm -hmm. it's hardly even discussed um, in the UK. We know it's been replicated in Canada and New Zealand and Australia, and it's happening some in the Netherlands. There's lots of replication of it and the data are just to die for, right? So when we look at the data coming out of America for school-wide PBS, we see that schools that run this over five years, because it takes an age to change a school culture, has better academic outcomes um, for the pupils. The pupils report less bullying. They report being happier. The teachers report being happier. The head teachers report being happier. Like the school improves on almost every metric when schools run school-wide PBS consistently for four to five years. So what some of the work we're doing in the UK now is trying to take the basic principles of school-wide PBS and how to use ABA at the school culture level um, and apply that to a British school, which has got just a different feel to it, um, a different culture. So again, not getting too caught up in what the application looks like, but taking the basic principles from that and making them relevant to our culture in mm -hmm. Northwest Wales. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for the listener, what mm -hmm. is PBS? I mean, okay. in Malaysia, I don't think that's something that we talked about a lot. In fact, I don't think a lot of us know what PBS is. So Maggie, if you could just- Sure. Yeah. So when we talk about school, this is where it gets messy, right? PBS doesn't mean anything. When we talk about school-wide positive behavior support, um, the founders of it will tell you that they didn't pick this name, that there was a grant application for positive behavior support in schools and they applied for it. And then what they did was called positive behavior support in schools. Okay, and that is one application of ABA, um, and I can explain that if you like. And then there's another application of ABA that we see in the UK, also called positive behavior support. And in some ways, this is a reaction to some of the negative um, press around ABA and the low style therapy and the early autism work, but it's an application of ABA that mostly works with older, um, learners who display have learning disabilities, display challenging behaviors in the community, um, people with acquired brain injury and dementia. And it uses uh, function-based behavior plans, but places a greater emphasis on adapting the environment, mm. right? So how can we create an environment where this person can be successful? And not always, but often an application of PBS is more about adapting the environment 
rather than changing behavior by altering the consequences. Okay, and so I think it's a really lovely and useful application for that population. Okay, I wouldn't necessarily use it with small children um, because with small children, actually they still have a lot of learning to do, right? Their behaviors aren't habits, they can grow and change and they have so much potential. But sometimes if you're dealing with um, an older adult in the community, um, their behaviors are, they have a long learning history with those behaviors. And so the most compassionate thing we can do is create environments where they can be successful. Mm -hmm. And that's what most people mean when they talk about PBS in the UK, which is different, unfortunately and confusingly, from school-wide PBS, okay? Because school-wide PBS um, definitely makes a greater use of consequence systems. Okay. So they're not, it's confusing. This is where the language just gets so convoluted um, because they're, they're both applications of ABA, but different applications, I'd say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So tell us about the school. Okay, you know, so the school-wide stuff. Right, the school-wide okay. stuff, yes. So school-wide PBS is based in the response to intervention model, okay? And this comes from health, and it's super easy to think about during a pandemic, we all understand mm. it, okay? So there are, the response to intervention model is about preventing challenging behavior. Okay, so essentially what we want to do is make sure that most kids in a school do not go on to develop challenging behaviors. And in fact, that they develop healthy, adaptive behaviors um, that enable their learning, right? So the first thing we're going to do is try and just have a system for everybody that effectively prevents the development of inappropriate behaviors. Okay, so if we think about this with COVID, right? I don't know how locked down you are in Malaysia oh, at the so moment. <laughs> But in the UK and Wales, um, there's still lots of uh, lockdowns. So we're quite limited in how many people we can be with. We're still wearing masks at the moment. Um, our kids keep getting sent home from school <laughs> every time COVID happens, right? Um, and those are to keep the population safe, okay? And then some people are still going to develop COVID symptoms, okay? And so for them, they are supposed to get a test in Wales and then they stay home and they lock themselves in a bedroom and people give them food wearing gloves and they open all their windows, right? right. And so they can be taken care of at home. And then what we try and do is to make sure fewer people get really ill and need, and need, need to be ventilated in a hospital. That's the worst outcome that um, is really terrible for the person who um, ends up in the hospital on a ventilator and also really strains the resources in the system, okay? So in the UK, we just don't have that many ventilators, that many hospitals, that many nurses. So we do all, so the bulk of the COVID energy is in prevention. Right. We don't want lots of COVID spreading around, okay? The same is true in schools for behavior. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we wanna prevent lots of kids from developing severe behaviors that are gonna reduce their chances of success in life and also just really test the resources of the system. So we do that by making sure that the whole school approach is solid, okay? And so that involves teachers clearly defining the behaviors they wanna see from their learners, okay? And this is where it gets really behavioral. So those behaviors should be specific. I, in this lesson, I want them to sit on the mat this far apart from the other students uh, with their hands to themselves, and if they answer, and I want them to raise their hand to answer a question, okay? In this lesson, I want them to work at tables um, in groups of four. I want them to speak quietly to one another and complete this work, okay? So when we move from the school to the uh, cafeteria, I want them to stand in a queue um, and quietly move. And then once they're at the table, they can talk in a loud voice, okay? Mm -hmm. So that we always know what are the behaviors that we expect. And then, like any good ABA program, the teachers make sure that they teach those behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. Do the kids know, do, can they? Is it developmentally appropriate for them to sit on the floor with their hands crossed for very long, right? Do they need practice on that? Do they need reminding of being quiet in the corridors? Okay, so we clearly define what, what behaviors specifically do we want to see? teach those behaviors, practice them until they become habits and routines. And then the major emphasis is on the reinforcement, mm -hmm. right? So acknowledging the kids when they do. Lovely sitting, 
absolutely you're following instructions. And this does not mean big overblown reward systems. I don't think, if I'm honest, for typically developing kids, traffic light systems and token boards and house points and computer points, that's just noise. I think for most typically developing learners, just acknowledgement for, I see you, I see you working the way you're supposed to. I see you being quiet in the hallways, right? I appreciate that you're doing these things. So just being seen um, goes a really long way um, for positive behaviors. And then because, you know, they're private, they're schools, right? And they're kids. And also, as we saw with COVID, right? Um, most people will follow the rules for acknowledgement, but some people won't, right? And so like in the UK, we had some really high profile cases of politicians breaking the rules. Everyone's outraged, right? Why am I following the rules and you can't? Um, and so we need to enforce the rules because schools are institutions and institutions have great sense of fair, right? Mm -hmm. And so teachers do need to decide what are the appropriate sanctions for inappropriate behaviors, okay? So if there's bullying or peer aggression or really you know, rudeness, how are the teachers going to respond and making sure they do it consistently, okay? So there's a consistent response to inappropriate behaviors the kids know about, the teachers know about. And when we've done this, we've done this in some schools where the, um, the school council, you know, so the, some of the kids sit with the teachers and they, they work out the disciplinary, they, kids, they're not, they, they're, they're like arbiters of fair, right? They don't mind discipline, right? They totally get that's, that's fair. Um, but they help write the discipline policy. And it's often things like, you know, missing a few minutes of lunch, staying after school, doing some extra lines. But we find that when that's happening consistently, we get a different reaction from the students, which is, yep, I broke the rule, that's mm -hmm. fair. Mm -hmm. Instead of, oh, miss, she's in a mood today, you know, where it's something the teacher's doing to them rather than, yeah, I made a mistake. I'm going to face the consequences, you know, fair enough. So it's about placing the emphasis on the positive, but also that consistency of response. Okay. But we also know, um, as behavior analysts, we know this really well, that sanctions and punishments don't teach new behaviors, right? So they sort of work at the institutional level. They can work as a deterrent because um, yeah, I won't do this because I don't want the sanction. They can be a stimulus to the other kids. Ooh, I best not do that because that's the consequence. But for the learner themselves, they're not, the person who broke the rule, had the inappropriate behavior, isn't learning how to do it better next time. So that, of course, needs to be coupled with a lot of skills training. If you have to give a sanction twice, it's not working as you intend it, right? So making sure that those kids then are maybe pulled aside and we think, why do they keep breaking this rule? What, you know, are they getting into a fight on the yard? Are they having trouble dealing with their emotions around a game on the yard? Is this work too difficult for them? And so they're getting restless. Um, and you know, looking for a little bit of extra stimulation outside the work. So asking why they're breaking the rules and teaching those skills. Okay. And so those kids might need a little bit extra support. Okay. So they might need a bit more time with the teacher. So you know, the beginning of the day at the end of the day. Um, in the UK right now, there's something very popular called nurture groups um, where kids get time um, with what they're calling an emotionally available adult. So someone just to talk to them, just to build that relationship and the connection in school. Do they need extra work? You know, do they just need a bit of remedial work on their, their academic work so that the tasks aren't so difficult and overwhelming? Um, if they're a child with additional needs, do they need just to get out of the room every now and then? Do they get overstimulated? Okay. And that's gonna work for about 80% of the kids. So like those, those are the equivalent of the children who are having COVID but are at home and not in the hospital. Okay. okay. And then we're still gonna get some learners and probably they have additional learning needs who despite everything being fab in school still are going to really struggle to meet the expectations for mm -hmm. the school. Okay. And those kids, and it could be between like three to 5% of the children in a school. So every school is gonna have one or two are gonna need a function-based behavior plan and a completely bespoke individual behavior plan, okay? So they're gonna need lots of resources. Um, and ideally, when school-wide PBS runs effectively, those children are caught very early, 
right? And they're given the support they need early so that those behaviors don't develop into habits that are gonna be really much harder to change um, as they grow. And so, like I said, the system, the evidence base for it is completely convincing and compelling um, in the USA, but we need to bring it into the UK and make it culturally relevant. So it's something that UK teachers can see working for them in their classrooms. Because um, like if we look at the American ones, if you look at their website, they absolutely recommend those greetings at the door. So you've seen these videos on the internet, right? Where they're high-fiving and they're, you know, it's not a British thing, right? <laughs> right? So we teachers say like, that is, I just can't see myself doing that. And the kid, my teenagers would be mortified if the mm. teacher was out there, you know? So it's just, <laughs> it doesn't work for anybody. So it's about separating the basic principles of PBS from the practice of PBS in the American schools and adapting the basic principles to work in the culture where we find them. Okay. Well, if somebody would come up and ask you, Maggie, what's so, you know, I heard, um, no, hang on, let me just backtrack. So is ABA, synot well, not synonymous, well, how does ABA come into this picture? Like where, where, how do you fit them in? Are they synonymous? Are they the same? Or like, can you have one without the other? Or do you, as AB naturally, the principles are embedded within the PBS system? Yeah, so, you know, so behavior analysts, so as you know, to be trained as a BCBA, it's a hard road. Um, and what a behavior analyst can do, like our superpower at the end of all that training is we can observe in a behavior in the environment and we can pretty quickly understand why that behavior is happening. Okay, What's reinforcing that behavior? The person's engaging that behavior because it works for them. Okay, And so that's what the behavior analyst brings to us. When the behavior analyst walks into the classroom, I can think, oh, well, see, you're giving lots of attention to the inappropriate. You think you're shouting. You think that should be like a punishment, but it's not. That's actually a reinforcement. Okay, So the behavior analyst is very skilled at understanding why the behaviors are happening. And the behavior analyst is able to make recommendations for how the teacher can change the environment so that positive behaviors are more likely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what we do at the population level. But of course, where behavior analysts really earn their uh, medal is for the, ch the students with the profound challenging behaviors. When we need to do a functional assessment, um, teach the skills, um, identify the skills, that the learner doesn't know, um, the skills that they need to engage in more appropriate behavior so they can meet their needs in a more appropriate way. Okay. So when we do this um, specifically, I guess what you're answering is how does it work? So in my programs, it works that the behavior analyst, every school that does school-wide PBS forms a school-wide PBS um, committee in the school. So the other thing that you need to make this work is the staff have to be on board because we're asking them all to be consistent, right? And that's hard, right? It's hard to be consistent all the time. Um, and they're gonna need to create this system for their school. So what works in one school won't work in another school, right? So the behavior analyst in this system helps steer this process. So they sit on the committee, they, you know, the teachers will say, you know, what, do, what behaviors do you want? I want them to listen. Well, mm. what does listening look like, right? I mean, how would you know someone's listening? Um, I want them to be happy. Well, well what does happy look like? Um, so we help identify those behaviors and then work around what is a reinforcer and what's the sanction, right? How are you going to deliver these things? So that at the school-wide level, the behavior analyst guides that process for a year or two and then remains on call to help with the inevitable um, three to five percent of students who are going to need that bespoke intervention. Okay, so what's your advice for someone like myself, right? Yeah. So I'm like, you know, my um, my area of competency is working one-on-one. -on -one. We do go into school, but even then too, it's not looking at the whole entire system. It's just looking at that one particular kid that we're working with. So if let's say I wanna have a career change, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I wanna work in school now. What should I be working on? Like, you know, is there anything that I need to gain um, knowledge in and, and be better at in order to do better in a school environment? 
I think the biggest mistakes behavior analysts make is that they become rule governed about practice, right? So we talk about this in behavior analysis. There's contingency governed, which means I sort of notice what's happening and I engage in behaviors to get the most reinforcement. And people actually are kind of not great at that because sometimes you just get stuck in habits, mm -hmm. right? And this is how I do it. This is how I was trained to do it. This is how I've always done it. And this is how I'm going to keep doing it. And I think a lot of behavior analysts can get quite rigid in how they deliver their practice. So this child with autism needs 20 hours a week of one-to-one, -one, and this is how it's going to look, and it should be in a room free of distraction with an RBT trained person only, and so these other people can't get involved. Um, and that excludes a lot of the other uh, stakeholders in the school, right? Because what happens is when you leave, that's just gone, mm -hmm. right? It's over. You haven't made any long-term, you've made a long-term change to that child, but not to the culture of the place. So behavior analysts have so much amazing knowledge, um, but it's, it should be used to work with the people, the teachers, the head teachers, um, the classroom assistants to understand what do they want changed, right? What would they like to see? Not what do you want, but what do they want in their schools? Um, what can they deliver reasonably? And then working with them to develop something that works. And it might be really small change, right? So when we're working with clients, we're so patient, right? We're so patient. Like, oh, I'm gonna toilet train this kid and it's gonna take six months. But you know, every milestone is celebrated, right? But when we work with an organization, we often want change really fast. Well, that, I wrote them a program and they're just not doing it, mm -hmm. right? When in fact, we have to shape that behavior as well. And shaping that behavior is probably more important, right, for long-term change, um, or as important, I'll say, not more important, but as important. So being willing to work really slowly and gradually um, to convince schools and parents um, that you have some expertise to offer is gonna make their lives better, right? But they still get to be in control. You're never in control, right? You're just, you're just offering some advice. Good advice. And um, so we also have parents who are listening and we also have teachers in mainstream mm -hmm. um, schools for listening. So if I bet they're thinking, oh, it's going to take forever for my school to have a system like that. You know, it sounds great. Um, I have, you know, this many kids in my classroom that clearly have um, needs and, and not being addressed. How do you, what are some tips? Do you have any for them on what they can do to start advocating for, you know. So the one of the easiest things that teachers can do in their classrooms is just that bit I was talking about of clearly defining your rules, mm -hmm. okay? So um, I had a master's student a few years ago and she was a, a design and technology teacher in a secondary school, right? And so all she did was post it on the wall, those exact things I was talking about. In this lesson, this is how, this, I want you to sit here. This is how you should be interacting with your peers. This is what you should complete, okay? It's called, again, it comes out of America and it's a little bit cringy, um, but it's called champs, right? And it's just this sort of, you know, how do I behave, right? And then the students are crystal clear on what's expected of them. So just clearly stating your rules is so important. The research shows overwhelmingly that the more positive a teacher is in their classroom, the better the classroom behavior. And there's no upper limit to this, right? So the ratio of positive to negative statements is really important. And there's this old adage that it should be four to one, but that's not evidence-based. No one knows where that came from. <laughs> but when we look at it, the more positive a teacher is, the better their classroom is. And so to really emphasize what the learners are doing well and acknowledge them. And then that consistency on the sanctions, I think is so important. Because often what I see when I go to a school is that you know, kids are being annoying on a Monday and she's like, I'm patient, I'm super cool. I can handle this, right? Um, so they're, they're just being kind of low level disruptive behavior and the teacher's like, I'm gonna ignore this. And then they get to Friday and they're exhausted and they have a headache and they don't mean to, but the kid does the exact same behavior and they get shouted at. Right, and now the child's thinking, Miss is in a mood. Miss is grumpy. This isn't about me. This is about Miss, because kids in Britain call their teachers Miss and Sir. <laughs> this is why I'm using these examples, right? So Sir is in a mood, 
and they don't take responsibility for it. So just that clearly stated expectations, more positive than negative feedback. And when you do use sanctions to use them, low, the lowest possible sanction applied consistently is incredibly effective. Thank you, thank you, Maggie. Um, Chewing, CY, do you have anything that you wanna add? I, I, I yeah, I have asked. No, I, I think you know, this can go on forever, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's just interesting because I think one of the things that we keep bringing up throughout this, this season of podcast is how do we work with other professionals? How do we work with other people? And like Maggie said just now as well, is that when you go into a school, you know, you are not in control. The teachers are in, in control. You need to know how do you work with them? How do you talk to them? How do you convince them? And you need to work at their pace, but not at your own pace. So I think that's like, you know, it's really important if for any behavior analyst, if they want to have a career change, career change, if they want to work in the school, like they need to know this, you know, like how do you fit into the classroom and yeah, how do you bond with the teacher? I think bonding is really important as well. And we talk a lot about building rapport with the kids that we work with. And so it's, I guess it's the same, you know, you build rapport with the individuals that you'd be working with in whichever organization that you find yourself in. Yeah. And well, if you're looking at sort of long-term change, then these special school programs now, every child who comes to that school every year gets an education a really good education, you know, that involves the principles of ABA. And so that's long-term sustained improvement, even though it didn't, it, it, when we first started delivering that model, that wasn't 40 hours a week. Oh, I, I kept me up at night, right? I'm like, I think we shouldn't be doing this because the evidence doesn't support it. Um, but now that it's embedded, I can clearly see all the good that's come from that early intervention with those children who wouldn't have otherwise received it. And also for behavior analysts, to have some courage then to try something new, as long as you're evaluating it, mm -hmm. right? So you're collecting, of course you are, you're a behavior analyst, you're collecting your data, you know if it's working, is to be a little bit flexible in your practice if that's gonna mean that the practice has greater social validity and is gonna be sustained longer um, than if you just do it the way right. you want to do it. Okay, got it, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you my so pleasure. much, Maggie, for your time. I mean, I've learned a lot and um, I'm sure the listeners who are listening in are also really inspired and hopefully teachers, BCBAs out there, yeah, thinking about bringing this into school because we definitely need it in Malaysia. We need it um, to be in schools and yeah, but we will be very patient, Maggie, and we will... <laughs> <laughs> we will do that so yeah so thank you thank you once again so much for your time my pleasure thank you. and that was dr maggie herger sharing with us the application of behavioral science in the school setting once again we thank dr maggie for joining us at seed podcast <laughs>